So welcome everyone. Today we have a pleasure to host Flaminia Giacomini. She finished her PhD in uh, Vienna recently, well, three years ago. And now she is a postdoc in Perimeter Institute. She's working in this fundamental things in quantum mechanics and interplay between uh, gravity and quantum mechanics. So when you contacted, she was asking a lot about how general the talk should be, how easy. So I will ask about a big introduction and I hope we'll all enjoy this talk. So Flaminia, the screen is yours. Thank you very much. And thanks a lot for this really nice invitation. Uh, I'm very happy to, to be able to present this work here. And yeah, so um, I work in fundamental physics and especially the interface between uh, quantum theory and gravity. And this is the topic of today's talk. Uh, and I'm going to talk about a formalism that uh, we set up uh, in, uh, well, I started setting it up during my PhD with my co-authors, my PhD supervisor, Chesra Bruckner, and uh, my uh, fellow PhD student, Esteban castro And then there's a lot more work on that that I will refer to today. And there are many more uh, papers on this topic now, and, but these are the ones that are relevant for the talk. So if you're interested in more literature, just please ask me. And so quantum reference frames is uh, not a new word in physics. It has been known at least since 1967, both in quantum information, where the first paper was by Aharonov and Saskin, and in quantum gravity, uh, where the first paper uh, can be traced back to the Witt. Uh, but uh, uh, so th there are different approaches, uh, which however are different to what I'm going to talk about today. So I would rather uh, talk about the more recent work that we've been doing on that, but please keep in mind that when you talk about like the general work quantum reference frames refers to much more than just what I will talk about today. So that's just an initial disclaimer. And so to give um, just an introduction and to get into the topic, the first thing I would like to talk about is what we usually mean by reference frame in physics. And usually uh, what we mean is a set of axes and a state of motion. So Reference frames are usually treated as abstract entities that are useful to fix the point of view from which observations are carried out. However, um, they are a very useful concept, but the principle of covariance then tells us that physics does not depend on our choice of reference frame. So we can write the laws of physics just in any uh, reference frame and everything will work perfectly and there's uh, no difference. So um, let's consider now just uh, quantum mechanics. And let's imagine that we want to uh, change the reference frame so from this reference frame to another reference frame, which can be just translated or moving with a, a constant um, uniform velocity from the point of view of the first one, and that would be a Galilean boost. So the the thing to keep in mind is that in quantum uh, mechanics, uh, this transformation can be represented as a unitary transformation. And this is the, uh, a possible representation. And, but what I would like you to focus your attention on here is that there, is, there are these quantity x0 and v, which are the uh, relative, uh, uh, basically it's the relation between the initial and the final reference frame. And this is encoded in a parameter of the transformation. And if we perform this type of transformation, the covariance of the laws of physics means that we have a specific recipe to change the dynamical law. And in particular, if it happens that the final Hamiltonian in the final reference frame has the same functional form as the initial Hamiltonian, then we say that we have a symmetry of the dynamics. So now let's think about it uh, a bit more concretely. What do we do when we uh, choose a reference frame and when we um, 
uh, when we measure distances, for instance. So now let's consider these three Canadian geese, A, B, and C. And if imagine that A now wants to know where B is, and she will fix a reference frame. For instance, she will pick a rock and she will take a ruler, she will put the end of the ruler on the rock, and then she will see how many ticks of the ruler there are on, uh, in to reach B. So, and, and the same uh, will do C or B if, if they want to do something analogous. So basically, um, if we take the perspective of A, A describes B and C, and will not describe herself. While if we take the perspective of C, for instance, C will just observe what B and A do and where they are at which velocity they move with respect to, uh, to herself. Um, and they will always use some physical system to fix the point of view, like for instance, the rock to, to see, okay, this is the origin of my reference frame. So what I want to say is that if we think about it in a more practical way, in a more operational way, then reference frames are physical systems. And physical systems are ultimately quantum systems. So now a question that comes naturally is what happens if instead of having these rocks here, I have some quantum state of the rock. So the question is, can I attach a reference frame to an object whose state is in a superposition of classical states, like a superposition of positions, for instance, or a superposition of velocities? And how would, uh, the re so how would I describe the rest of the physical systems from the point of view of this green rock or of this yellow rock? So, this introduces the notion of quantum reference frame. And to make it a bit more specific, I have already introduced when I was giving you this example, the um, a relational notion. So the fact that if I take my, if, the, if, if I take the C rock as my reference frame, then what I'm actually doing is I'm not describing C, but I'm only describing the relative distance between A, C and A and C and B. And this is basically, you can picture it. So there is, a, there is more work to be done to, to fully explain this, but um, intuitively the idea is that the center of mass degrees of freedom uh, do not matter physically. Uh, if I take into account everything, all the systems that I have, because if imagine that I have only A, B, and C and nothing else, if I put them here or I just rigidly translate the whole system here, there is no difference in the physics because I'm just taking everything that I have and moving it. So basically, I, if I have three systems in the end, the, the important degrees of freedom that are the relational ones, which are two. So I'm, I'm just taking everything into account, all the relevant physical information in this way. And instead, imagine that we want to, so we have a, a system A and a system B, which are in a quantum state. And now I want to take instead a different perspective, which is the perspective of this green rock. And if I do, I can do that. And what I will see is something like that. So I will see the state of B and C, which is in a quantum state. Um, and, and in the following, I will try to make um, sense of this notion in a more a concrete way. But before, let me tell you why we want to do that. And the reason, uh, I want to use a very practical reason, uh, which is this paper that came out last year in Marcus Aspelmeyer group. So in this paper, what they did, this is an amazing experimental result. They, uh, they took these spheres, uh, these golden spheres. So you see, this is a one euro cent. So these are really small and they weigh about 90 milligrams. And they 
measured the gravitational interaction between two of these spheres. So this is the lightest object for which the gravitational field has been measured. So the gravitational field produced by these uh, uh, spheres was measured, not the one of the Earth. And, uh, and there is some uh, experimental effort now that is going on uh, to reduce the uh, even more the range of the masses for which we can measure the gravitational field. And eventually, the long-term goal is to measure the gravitational field that is sourced by a mass in a quantum state. So for instance, in a quantum superposition of positions. And what is that? So in, in that case, I do not have a classical space time anymore. Um, because I have a gravitational source in a, in a quantum superposition state. And so if I have a non-classical space-time, then uh, this means that I cannot use anymore the notion of a classical reference frame, but I need to replace it with something else, for instance, quantum reference frames. And so this is the general motivation, the foundational motivation of this line of research. And this is, at least for me, it's, it's interesting uh, because uh, these, new, these new experiments, these new technologies that are being developed now, like for instance, in Marcus's group, but also in many other groups in the world, um, could offer a new window on the interface uh, between quantum theory and gravity. And so we can learn uh, from these experiments. And it's useful to start thinking about what we will be able to get once these experiments will be available. So let's get into the details of the formalism now. And in the first part, let's forget about gravity for the moment. And let's just set the stage with um, just standard non-relativistic quantum theory. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to take an initial reference frame, a quantum system B, which is in, in some quantum state phi, and do a transformation from a reference frame that is centered here to a reference frame that is simply displaced by XA. So in quantum theory, we know how to do that. We just apply this translation operator to the state, and XA here is a number, and it's just the relative distance between C and the new reference frame. But now imagine that instead of having this sharp position, we have another quantum state A, and we want to take the perspective. So we want to describe the B from the point of view of A. And, and here we cannot just pick a single position, but we have to do something else. So how do we do it? Well, a possibility is to take seriously the linearity of quantum theory and say, okay, I do not have a single position by which I can translate this, but I can translate by all possible positions uh, on the real axis in a quantum superposition. And then I can notice that it will be more likely to find particle A in this point rather than in this point. So this point counts more loosely speaking. And so what I will do is I will weigh the translation on the quantum state of A. And if I do this procedure, uh, what I will get is this operator. And let's see the differences. So first, you see here, I only had the state of B, which is the quantum system, and is the one that we usually describe when we do the transformation between two classical reference frames. But here I also added this state psi, which is the quantum state of the quantum reference frame. So basically the reference frame itself becomes a physical system and we treat it exactly on the same grounds as every other physical system. So we do not have a difference anymore between reference frame and quantum systems. They're just treated as two exactly equivalent quantum systems. And then, this is also a very general feature of a quantum reference frame transformation. We take the parameter of the transformation between two classical reference frames, 
and we promote it to an operator on the Hilbert space of the quantum reference frame. So that's what we, uh, what we are doing. And then we have to do one more thing, which is add to this operator, this other operator here. So we, we have, this is a composition of two operators and this operator, we call it the parity swap. And so this parity swap has this action, so it puts a minus and it swaps the labels A and C, both for X and for P. And the, the physical intuition for that is um, to realize basically this line of the transformation. So when I was telling you before that if I am in C, I observe A with position XA, and if I'm in A, I observe C with this position QC, then just by vector composition, you see how these two are related. And hence, uh, this operator completes this part of the transformation, basically. And- Excuse me, so, just to be sure, what is QC? Yes. QC would be- It's position, it's a position operator. So I just- This is actually- Defined by this first equation where I have this uh, PXA P dagger. This is giving the definition of QC or this is the definition, definition of P? Can be the... uh, so this is just a parity operator. It's just a parity operator of quantum theory. Uh, and with, in addition, the label swap. I think, um, pardon, I, as far as I understand, perhaps I'm wrong, but as far as I understand, QC is a position of C with respect to A. XA is a position of A with respect to C. You are changing, yeah. the, you are changing the reference frame and Flaminia now changed the, she changes the, the letters. So Xs are positions with respect to uh, C and Qs are positions with respect to A. Mm -hmm. okay. We have, uh, if, please correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, but as far as I understand, we have three systems. Two will serve as a reference frame, and the third one is the system that we want to describe. Okay. So we are switching between uh, initially C system to A system as a reference frame. Yeah. Is that correct? Am I, am I yes. right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Correct. And, and because it's 1D, I and mean, here in this example, it's all one dimensional. So we have to reverse the, the positions if we mm -hmm. move from, from uh, C to A. Yeah. Okay. Did I, did, I, did I get it correctly from you? Yeah. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have also one question because with this uh, substitution of X by X uh, operator X, A, uh, simply you extended the Hilbert space, right? At the moment you are not treating the system only the system B as a quantum system, but you extended the, the, your system to another subsystems and now the description is completely different, right? Yes, yes. So, so the, now the, the total Hilbert space from the perspective of C is the Hilbert space of A and B. And the Hilbert space from the perspective of A is the Hilbert space of B and C. These two are isomorphic and the transformation is unitary. So basically, you have the same information, but just reshuffle differently. Mm -hmm. Is this clear? Yes, this is clear, but uh, okay. I will keep my questions for later discussion, maybe. Maybe you will- but, but as, uh, as, as far as I understand, that's the whole trick, right? That's the whole, uh, the whole novelty of, uh, of the uh, approach, of your approach that you are, uh, treating like mathematically speaking what was before a parameter now becomes an operator but physically the source of this parameter so to say so the reference frame is no more an abstract entity but a, a quantum quantum system right so that's the whole the whole essence of the of the idea is that correct yes so, yes, yes but in, in previous description this parameter was only the parameter of functions or operators acting on uh, system B. Now these are operators acting on system A. That's the whole trick. And giving a, uh, uh, as a result, giving a parameter for operators acting on system B, right? 
so you have um, basically an, an entangling operation, and we will see yeah. that in the next slide, uh, where the parameter of the transformation, so before this was just a number, it was not an operator, it, it's a function or a function, time dependent yeah. function. Um, and this was an operator acting on B. So here we still have the operator acting on B, but in addition, we have also an operator acting on A. Yes, but from the point of view of the uh, system B, this is still an, a, fun, a normal number, right? But this number is determined by quantum system A. Well, if you expand this quantum state in position basis, then yes, this will pick the position of yeah. the quantum state of A and then act on B. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so I will give you some examples. So here we start from C as the initial reference frame. We go to A as the final reference frame, and they will both describe B. So first, what happens if A is sharply localized in position basis? We recover the usual uh, translation to a reference frame, to a classical reference frame. So in this case, um, when I move to the reference frame of A, I will see C in minus the position of A and B rigidly translated. Then I can take a slightly more complicated situation, which is a product state of A and B, where A is in a quantum superposition of, say, x1 and x2. In this case, for each one of these classical positions, I have this situation here, so a standard uh, transformation, standard translation. But I will perform the in a, in a quantum superposition and keeping track of, so basically, since I also describe C in from the perspective of A, I will keep track of whether A was in X1 and X2. So what I get now is an entangled state where all the relative distances are preserved. So when A was in X1, C is in minus X1, and B is um, translated by X1. And when A was in X2, C is in minus X2, and B is translated by X2. So here we have a general feature of quantum reference range transformation, which is that entanglement and superposition are a quantum reference train uh, dependent feature, and they're not given a priori. And in this case, we went from a product state to an entangled state, but we can also do the opposite. And we can go from an entangled state, which is perfectly correlated in position basis, meaning that the relative distance between A and B is always L, um, to a state that is a product state where B is always localized around L and C is in a quantum superposition of being a minus this distance, minus this distance. And it, this, we can take it to the extreme by considering an, EP, an EPR state. Well, so this is a non-normalized EPR state where basically it's just a generalization of this one we have always the same relative distance between A and B. And if we go now to relative coordinates between A and B, you see if I sub subtract this small x from this uh, uh, cat here, then I will get that B is always localized at this capital X and C is spread out the whole Hilbert space. So this was a description that uh, did not include any dynamics of the system, and that just gave you the simplest transformation that we can conceive to a quantum reference frames. But there are more. I can come up with many, many possible quantum reference frames transformations. And in particular, a class of transformations that are interesting are extended Galilean transformations. And these are transformations of this type. In particular, the ones that uh, we want to look at are translations, boosts, and accelerated reference frames. So these um, basically have all, um, so they have a different function for this X, capital X of T, but in quantum theory, they can all be represented with a unitary operator. And um, the dynamical law of the system, so in our case, this would be system B, changes in this way. 
Um, and that's just if you plug this into the Schrodinger equation, you will just get it. So if I do that, if I start from a free particle Hamiltonian, then I will see that except in this case of the accelerator reference frame, I still get a free particle Hamiltonian. Um, how does it work in quantum reference frames? So the transformation law is basically the same, except that I also need to take into account the Hamiltonian of the quantum reference frame. So instead of having just here the Hamiltonian of B from the perspective of C, I will have the Hamiltonian of A and B from the perspective of C. And then I can uh, build a superposition of extended Galilean transformations. So I, will, I wrote them here schematically. They have a specific uh, representation that is much more complicated, but the core of the transformation is what is written here. So this one, this three, is the standard extended Galilean transformation. And now you see that the parameter, so xi, vi, or the acceleration, is controlled by an additional Hilbert space, which is the Hilbert space of the quantum reference frame. So in particular, for this one, this one is uh, more tricky to build. And there are some caveats, because of course, we don't have an acceleration operator in quantum theory. Uh, so this is really just take it as, a, like as an intuitive description of the transformation. Uh, but what is true is that this can, in, in more, qu in more quantum information language, uh, the quantum reference frame transformation is a quantum control transformation on the Hilbert space of the quantum reference frame. So the quantum reference frame serves as a control to uh, basically decide the parameter of the transformation. And this, uh, so this generalization allows us also to change the dynamical law accordingly um, in, as was written in the previous slide. So we can change the Hamiltonian, we can just compute a new Schrodinger equation. But in particular, when I take these two transformations here, the translation and the boost, and I extend them to superpositions of translations and superposition of boosts, then I, find that if I start from a free particle Hamiltonian for A and B, I end up with a free particle Hamiltonian for B and C. So I take all labels A and I swap them to C. And this is what we mean by an extended symmetry of the dynamics. Uh, so this allowed us to generalize the, the, the dynamical symmetries of, uh, um, of the Hamiltonian. So this is everything I wanted to tell you concerning the uh, non-relativistic part of the quantum, of quantum reference frames. Now, I motivated this research line uh, saying that it, it is interesting to look at the intersection between gravity and quantum theory. So the next topic that I would like to address is the equivalence principle. What can we do with quantum reference frames uh, when we look at the equivalence principle, and in particular to situations where we have superposition of space times that I'm going to, def to define. So first, uh, let us just set the stage for uh, saying why we want to look at the equivalence principle. So the equivalence principle is one of the pillars of general relativity, it's one of the fundamental principles, but it is also a very useful tool to test alternative theories of gravity. And uh, there have been a lot of tests of the uh, equivalence principle, which are usually done with classical particle and in classical space time. And there have been some proposals to consider quantum versions of the equivalence principle. And I will just name one, which also concerns the internal de degrees of freedom. So basically how the internal degrees of freedom contribute to a quantum definition of the equivalence principle. And um, so these two papers are the, the 2017 is an experimental paper that tests the theory paper that was actually before on the archive. Uh, that is the one 
uh, in 2018. And so the, but now um, these tests were done. Uh, so also this proposal relied on uh, particles that whose position like which were in a classical space time basically. So now uh, the, there there have also been uh, papers in the literature that instead were interested to see what happens to the equivalence principle in more general situations, such as what, what happens when particles have wave packets instead of sharp like a word line, classical word line, what happens if I put things in a superposition, and what happens if I do not have a classical space time anymore. And there were uh, quite, a, I mean, there, there's quite a tradition in the literature in, uh, uh, for, for this. So what, and whatever we're going to find is going to be interesting because if we find that the Einstein equivalence principle is still valid in some form, then we have a principle to retain to build a theory at the interface of quantum and gravity. And if instead it's violated, then this will point to an element that we have to modify. So there are also different versions of the equivalence principle. There's the weak equivalence principle, which is the universality of free fall. And um, it can be phrased uh, with the very with the famous example of the Einstein elevator. So if we have a part uh, uh, like somebody in an elevator that is accelerated with acceleration A, then this is equivalent to having this person standing on the ground in a uniform and constant gravitational field with constant G equal to minus A. Then there is, for instance, the Einstein equivalence principle uh, which has this different formulation that is that if I have a manifold, so a space, you, you can see this as a classical space time, and I take any point, an arbitrary point in this uh, space time, then I can build a coordinate transformation to what I will call a locally inertial frame, such that in the new coordinate system, the metric is Minkowski at this single point, P, and the first derivative of the metric vanishes at this point, and then I will have something uh, like, I will have departures from Minkowski in a neighborhood. And this is the version of the equivalence principle that we are going to consider, and it can be argued that this formulation encodes, like the equivalent Einstein equivalence principle encodes the metric structure of space time. There are other formulations also of the strong equivalence principle, for instance, but we will not uh, talk about them. Um, so, in particular, here I want to address the Einstein equivalence principle in uh, that we, uh, so I will refer to this paper here. Uh, the weak equivalence principle is contained instead in this other paper, but I will not going to, uh, I'm not going to talk about today. And in particular, what the, the Einstein equivalence, what this generalization uh, does, it considers quantum particles, it considers a superposition of states of motion, for instance, like particles that are in a superposition of freely falling um, states. Uh, even though this, I, I, I'm not going to talk about this explicitly. And then also a superposition of classical space times. So here we need to define what we mean uh, by superposition of classical space times. And we identify the regime in which we are with three assumptions. The first one is that uh, if I have two states of the gravitational fields that are perfectly distinguishable in an operational sense, then these are assigned orthogonal quantum states. The second one is that for each one of these well-defined gravitational fields, I can use a general relativistic description. And the third one is that the quantum superposition principle holds for these states of the gravitational field. And these are assumptions that, for instance, have been considered to be valid 
uh, in a, a lot of uh, recent literature, for, for instance, when masses are in a quantum superposition state. So these are usually situations that are described uh, by um, a perturbative approach to gravity. So in particular, you take gravity, you expand it perturbatively in the weak field regime, and then you quantize the perturbation. So this is called linearized quantum gravity, and that's a perfectly well-defined um, theory. And if these two states of the mass that are put in a quantum superposition uh, do not overlap, then we are in this regime. Uh, but this regime is in principle a bit more, uh, more general, so it does not only include uh, these situations that I described, but this is a very useful uh, uh, example to think of, to keep in mind, to, to get a, an intuitive picture of what is going on. And so this is our uh, generalization of the Einstein equivalence principle that is basically we adapted from the gravitation book. And the key to that is that we have a quantum state of a system P that lives in a superposition of classical spacetime, and we find a quantum local inertial frame. So we introduce this, this uh, concept uh, transformation to the quantum reference frame of P, such that the metric is locally Minkowski at the origin of the quantum reference frame. So the, what I'm going to do in, for the rest of the talk is to define what we mean by quantum local inertial frame and to build a transformation to this quantum local inertial frame. So to do that, let's use our first assumption. Let's consider uh, a state of a classical spacetime. So this is just a classical spacetime and we just assign this cat G to this state. Then we consider a point in this, uh, in this spacetime. So now what I will do is I will introduce classically the, the local inertial frame transformation, and then I will tell you how to deal with it when we have a quantum reference frame. So at this level, this is just a point in the, in the spacetime, but then we will promote this to the position of a particle P. So if I take this point, then, to build a transformation to a local inertial frame, then I have to change the coordinates from x to psi. And this will have a functional form. I can tailor expand it. I only need the first order. And then I will call the coefficients of the first order uh, tail uh, expansion, tailor expansion f. Then I can picture the change to a local inertial frame as a two-step procedure. The first step is to recenter the reference frame in this point P. So this would be this part here. I take uh, x minus xp as the new uh, coordinate. Um, so I will, um, and then the, se the second step is to stretch the metric with this um, so that the metric looks like Minkowski at this point. So recenter and stretch. Um, and if I do that, and then uh, I, I know how to, well, the, the gravitational field changes in this way in general relativity. Um, and if I do that, and then I evaluate this at psi equal to zero, I have enough freedom in these coefficients to fix uh, the new metric field G alpha beta of zero to be Minkowski at this point xp, so at where, where p is, and then I will have some departures from Minkowski in, in the neighborhood. And that's just a local inertial frame transformation. Excuse me. Ah, yeah. Excuse me. I think that in order to get uh, everything vanishing up to the second order, you also need to impose conditions on the second derivatives of x to kill the Christopher. No, the, the second order, uh, no, you, you don't kill the, uh, the so uh, for the, for what uh, concerns the, uh, just the local inertial frame, you just fix the, the first order of the Taylor expansion of the coefficients and the the metric is automatically, so the first derivative of the metric at the point is automatically zero. And then you will have 
that the uh, so you will have departures of the in the second order which corresponds to the fact that you cannot set to zero the curvature because that's uh, um, that's a, a tensor quantity, so you, you cannot do that. Mm. Okay, let, let's talk about it later. But thank you. And <clears throat> okay, so, um, uh, okay, so if we do that in uh, um, quantum theory, so let's assign a state to P. So let's consider a cat with position xp, this cat g, and then just uh, the position, like the coordinate system x. So this transformation here can be implemented in um, a unitary way um, with this ug of p. And then I can represent this by acting on this quantum state, and I will go to this new coordinate system xi. And so at this level, these two cats are really not very important, but uh, so I'm just adding them for what will come next. But now let's consider P instead of, so let's say that this XP is actually the position of a particle P. And let's allow this particle P to be in a quantum superposition state, for instance, X1 and X2 in space time, this sign. So now we can use the same trick that we use with quantum reference frame transformation. We take a quantum control transformation on the state of P. So basically we will implement a different UG of XP depending on whether P is in X1 or is in X2. And then I can just use this definition here to obtain the final state where uh, if I look at what this metric field G1 tilde and G2 tilde are at the origin of P, so basically when I recenter my reference frame in the position of P that, is, that was in a quantum superposition, so in a quantum reference frame sense, I obtain that it is, all, it is Minkowski at the origin. And by linearity, here I just consider a superposition of two positions, but I can take any uh, arbitrary state of P. So this works for just general states. Finally, I can consider a quantum superposition of two different space times, where remember that one of our assumptions was that the principle of linear superposition holds for these two part, for these two space times, and that these two are orthogonal. So what we want to do is to build a unitary quantum reference frame transformation to the quantum uh, reference frame of P that now is also in a superposition of space times. And again, we have the same trick of quantum reference frames. Here we have the standard uh, local inertial frame transformation, but now we control it on both the position of P and on the state of the space time G, that can be either G1 or G2. And again, once we evaluate the, the, the metric field in the uh, center of, so at the, at the center of our new quantum local inertial frame, so at the origin of P, then we still find that the metric field is locally Minkowskian at the origin of the final quantum reference frame, regardless of whether we like which metric field we started with or which quantum state of P we had at the beginning. And this is the extension of the uh, Einstein equivalence principle to quantum reference frames, where I didn't cover the last part that we have in the paper, which is also the dynamics of the quantum reference frame. So we also consider freely falling particles. Then I said that the Einstein equivalence principle is useful when uh, it comes to alternative theories of gravity. And a very famous example is Penrose decoherence. Uh, so in uh, Penrose uh, basically um, proposed a mechanism that he refers to as spontaneous state reduction, uh, motivating it with, uh, by saying that if I have a quantum, uh, so a, a mass in a quantum superposition, 
then um, I have a, a clash between the two fundamental principles of quantum theory, that is the principle of linear superposition, and the Einstein equivalence principle. So these two cannot go well together when I have a quantum, like a, sor a source of the gravitational field in a quantum state. And so what he says is that we have a, a, an unstable configuration and in the, uh, basically one of the branch will die out in some time that he estimates. So, however, what we showed here is that this is not necessarily so. You can say, okay, the Einstein equivalence principle doesn't hold as in general relativity because we have to generalize it to allow for quantum superpositions of space times. And if you do that, then you can reconcile the Einstein equivalence principle with the principle of linear superposition. And the question now is, can we test it? And yes, we can test this. Clearly, the test will be on the Earth because we do not have tests in a non-classical spacetime. But this is some work that I've done with a master's student. And we tested it. We proposed a, a, an interferometric test with entangled clocks. Uh, so here we have the gravitational field of the Earth and an, an, atomic inter, an atom interferometer where the two clocks are sent in an entangled state, either in the lower or in the upper trajectory. And what we did, so the Einstein equivalence principle is usually tested by testing the three aspects, which are the weak equivalence principle, local Lorentz invariance, and local position invariance, where local Lorentz invariance and local position invariance refer to basically the effects of uh, the, when the clock is at a different height in the gravitational field on time dilation and the a different and moves at different relativistic velocities. And we formulated uh, these three aspects uh, by allowing the quantum state of the clock to be in a quantum superposition. And uh, this uh, constitutes, and, and we formulated a test for that. And an interesting thing that, uh, are, uh, that comes out is that you can transform to the quantum reference frame of the clock. And the, you find an effect that is the relative delocalization of quantum operations from the perspective of different clocks that are, have a quantum state and which is delocalized either in position or momentum. So basically, um, what happens is that when you move to the quantum reference frame of the clock, the clock just has some proper time and it ticks according to its proper time and doesn't know just the time flows naturally for the clock itself. But when the clock looks at other clocks, then it will see that a quantum operation that for the, in the reference frame of one clock is localized from the perspective of the other clocks, it's delocalized in time. So the localization of operations is a relative concept. And uh, this is an effect that came out also in a previous result um, uh, that was this one, uh, that is, um, but the, in, that, in that case, it was due to the gravitational interaction between the clocks. While in this case, and also in uh, this paper, that was the first, the, the one that studied it, uh, in the, like also before the other, the, the, the explicit test of the equivalence principle. Um, this, this happens because the, the clock itself is delocalized in a gravitational field. Um, so, but the, the take home message of, of this test is that if the Einstein, this, this, if this generalized Einstein equivalence principle is violated, then it is impossible to define time evolution in the quantum reference frame of, the, of a quantum particle. And so basically this would mean that if I send a clock in a quantum superposition you know, in the gravitational field of the earth, then this clock stops working. Like it doesn't even make sense to ask how time flows uh, for this clock. So that's everything I wanted to say. 
what I've presented here is an operational and relational formalism for quantum reference frames, which associates a reference frame to a quantum system. And in quantum mechanics, uh, we have seen that some effects are the frame dependence of entanglement and superposition, the generalization of the notion of covariance, a generalization of the weak equivalence principle that I only mentioned without showing you, and something that I didn't have time to cover is that it allows also this uh, approach allows us to have an operational definition of the rest frame of the quantum system, which in particular we apply to the case of a relativistic spin operator and define a relativistic circular experiment. And in gravity, uh, I showed you the generalization of the Einstein equivalence principle and how it relates to parallel coherence. And this is all. Thank you for your attention. And I'm happy to take questions. Okay, thank you very much for the talk. So now we have time for questions. Can I have a question? Yes, please. And then there will be time. Well, the measurement of time is extremely important for setting the standards. My question is, do you envision any changes that people who set standards assuming certain differences between the energy levels defined the second now. So is there some problem with this if you include the effects that you were discussing? Uh, so I think uh, you wouldn't have uh, a problem in terms of the definition of the time standards, uh, but I think you would have an extension of the situations where you could use these standards. Be so basically, it, it, so one, one thing that comes out of this uh, whole framework for quantum reference frames is that uh, this is a quantum formalism, basically. It's, uh, you, you, can, you, you can describe everything in, in terms of quantum theory, uh, but you apply it to a broader range of contexts. And I think you will have the same thing for, uh, for time standards. So you say that if these clocks are used in different gravitational fields, they will still give the same measurement of time? So uh, I, I, what I'm saying is that the time also is defined relationally. So from if you are in the laboratory, for instance, you will see, if, and I send the clock in a quantum superposition in the gravitational field, then we have, well, we can use the slogan lower is lower. So the clock that is lower in the gravitational field is lower than the clock that is higher in the gravitational field. And there, there was some result uh, in uh, Chaslav's group before I joined the group that if you build an interferometer and you take this into account, then at the end of the interferometer, you have a reduction of visibility in the interferometer. And this is an effect of the gravitational time dilation. Uh, but if you now go to the quantum reference frame of this clock, this clock has some parameter that you can, cons you can treat as proper time. And this will just be the, the normal proper time that we use in general relativity. It's just that proper time of clock A, uh, when you look at it from a different clock B, then this proper time will be in a quantum superposition. Well, uh, strange, but maybe now let's go with the next questions and maybe we'll come back to that. So now Tai, please. Uh, actually, uh, as you, you explain, the Schrodinger equation, our Schrodinger equation, not, not actually covariant form in the, any uh, quantum observer, right? Sorry, I didn't get it. I mean, the, our Schrodinger equation, it is not actually covariant under any uh, quantum observer, right? Um, okay, in uh, which form? Okay, so the- Because you agree we, have ex, we will have an extra term due to the, uh, the, due to the, the time dependence of a unitary operator. 
yes. So, um, okay. So do you agree with the definition of covariance that I gave, which is the unitary operator? I can maybe take it again. Because uh, when we have a unitary, uh, time dependent unitary operator, yeah, this extra term, this extra so, to that extra term. Actually. Yeah, but I would, yeah, okay. So I would say that the, so everything in the, okay, let me just take it. So every, if the Hamiltonian transforms as in this green box, then it's covariant. That's my, def, that's the definition of covariance. But only this type of actually transformation, not actually all general actually, tra uh, Trans quantum transformation doesn't allow our Schrodinger equation is covariant. Because if we have actually covariant form of equation independent of uh, any observer, uh, you should have a different form of Schrodinger equation. Because so I I do not understand if you're talking about a proper time effect now, like the difference between, like if you want I mean, to transform time. Here, time is considered as a parameter. We are just in non-relativistic quantum mechanics. I mean, let let I mean, I, I, let let forget about actually this uh, question. But anyway, my question was uh, uh, when you try to construct the equation uh, independent of. Um, uh, equation form of equation independent of uh, observer, we have to have a covariant form, but that covariant form in the classical uh, like uh, uh, equation, it is uh, like a general covariance. But when you talking of when you are talking about Schrodinger equation, we, if you try to have a general uh, covariance covariant form of equation, you should have actually more extended actually version of. Uh, covariant form because uh, not only actually coordinate transformation, we need actually more general transformation uh, in, in operator. But Schrodinger equation itself currently because of the time derivative of the Schrodinger equation, it doesn't allow we have, have completely covariant form of uh, equation. Okay, so maybe we have to distinguish the different regimes. So in just standard quantum mechanics, where you like non relativistic quantum mechanics, where time is a parameter and does not change, then this is the definition of covariance, and this is just textbook definition. I didn't uh, I didn't make it up, uh, and this just comes. Uh, so basically, you find if this h is in a Schrödinger equation, this h prime is also in a Schrödinger equation. That's everything that covariance means. And then if you want to consider also relativistic effects or even general relativistic effects, clearly this definition is no longer enough and you have to adapt your definition of covariance to the possibility for time also to change. And then I agree with you that, I mean, you have to do something more to... to Maybe uh, I yeah. propose that we'll, because we have more questions, okay. I propose that maybe you allow other uh, people to ask the next person was Jarek Korbic, please. Okay, so uh, I have a question regarding the basic uh, the basic trick that you are using. So substituting what used to be a parameter with an operator. Am I right that this will not work for rotations because there is no phase operator? <laughs> okay, yes, that's a good question. So uh, there is there is a problem with that, right? You can uh, substitute x piece uh, for operators, but if you take it to 3D or 2D actually, and you start um, looking at rotations, then there is a problem because you cannot quantize phase. But what you can do, you can quantize sine and cosine properly. Yes, yeah? exactly. But you cannot, you cannot quantize phase. Am I right that that's the problem? So yes, exactly. So rotations are, uh, are nasty. <laughs> and, um, so in particular, if you try to do it in, in this way, uh, how we did it here, it's extremely complicated to um, well, it would to not, not generalize work. It will straightforwardly. Not work. We have a different formulation for that, mm. uh, which is given in terms of constraint systems, um, where we basically just impose global rotation invariance, 
and then we so classically you, you would have a gauge fixing to go to one reference frame or another you know in the quantum case it's more complicated than that uh, and in the end you can also uh, define rotations with some subtleties basically um, but it's a definitely much more complicated treatment so there, there are ways around it but uh, it's uh, technically much like very very cumbersome and yeah. you have to exclude some configurations because on some configurations you have like you have the, the transformation is not well defined, like like full alignment, and when everything coincides, you, you have to exclude this uh, um, these configurations here, for instance. So like you don't have that the transformation is globally defined. But yeah, that's that's a that's a more mathematical um, observable okay, that you can get around. That, that seems like a, like a big trouble. Um, I, another question, uh, what was this state G in your uh, second part of the talk when you were considering uh, EET? Uh, there, was, there was this state uh, which was supposed to represent space time. So uh, could you give us a hint what is supposed to be this cat G in the brown box, for example? So in, in general, um... So or is it some I'm, abstract, some abstract a, yes, say, first, formal? You say, okay, whatever it is, let's let's us assume that uh, space time can be represented by some quantum state, and we call this we parameterize these states by metrics, and we call them cat g. It's some formal yes. formal construction. Am I right? Like yes, and we and we gave paper. it some transformation properties. Uh, that uh, that are in the page, like so, we we made some assumptions on how what how this state will behave under. Ah, instance, so probably prob probably if you have if you uh, if you apply um, um, transformation uh, coordinate uh, unitary, then the G inside should transform like it would transform classically. So if there are yes. tensors like exactly. this F F and G is shifted to another point, right? So that would be probably exactly. the, the the symmetry. The symmetry operation here, and the the case in which you can say a little bit more of what this G is is if you describe it in uh, linearized quantum gravity. But this is of course okay. Have. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. of course you can. Yeah, yeah. Then, then you can you, you can give it a meaning. Uh, and the uh, last question, if I may, mm, could you... maybe we oh. are also Mikolai right. to ask right. sure. other people, sure, 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 and then sure. you will. So and Mikolai, maybe back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, here's Mikhail Kozinski. So uh, I have two questions. The first one was in fact related to the previous one uh, Jarek asked. Well, ideally you'd like to promote not Galilean transformations, but the full Lorentz group or the Poincaré group to, 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 to this kind of transformations, right? But I understand that this is difficult. Yeah, the Lorentz group is difficult. Um, so we have superpositions of Lorentz boosts uh, but they they have a rather different status to uh, the the Galilean. So, for instance, in, for the Galilean transformations, that's something else I didn't talk about, but we showed uh, with other uh, collaborators that the set of Galilean transformations form a group, for instance, and uh, which is different to the Galilean group. Uh, but you can close the group, so that's fine. Um, so th there is a group that is well defined. While for the, we were also trying to look at the, whether the same could be done for the Lorentz group, but that's a different. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess partner, I guess the, the rotations are the problem. Yeah, the, the rotations are the problem, but anyway, it would be extremely interesting if you manage or anybody manages to get around the rotations to see, for example, this quantized analog of uh, Thomas precession. When you, when you, combine two boosts and you get this uh, effective uh, effective rotation, for example. But it yeah. doesn't seem straightforward at all. Excuse me, and, and I've got a second question. Uh, it's exactly about this slide. So I'm a relativist. If I understand correctly, you, you, you consider your transformations basically transformations of the coordinates. And here you prescribe a transformation which takes your point to a point you, 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 you want and you, and you prescribe the first derivatives. I think that with this type of approach, you can indeed make your metric look like Minkowski at a given point. But in order to kill the first derivatives, you need to prescribe the second derivatives of your coordinate change as well. 
because without that you will not have locally Minkowskian in the sense of disappearance of the first derivatives of your of your metric. So I think that this change of coordinates you you, you write here is a bit too small for 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 what you would like to do. So there wouldn't be a problem also prescribing the second order derivative, uh, like the, the second derivative of, but I think the, the first one should be enough. The first one will give you certainly that G becomes eta at a given point, but you would like to have also the disappearance of the first derivative of, eta, of, of G. And this would require the second one. So I, I'm, I'm pretty sure about that, but we can talk about it later if you wish. Okay. If I understand everything correctly. Okay, thank you. Yeah, let's thank the speaker again.